If you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn to Acts chapter 18. Acts 18 will be in verses 1 through 17. Thank you, choir, for uh, reminding us of God's goodness. Thank you for uh, reminding us to praise him, that if we don't, even creation will praise him and does praise him. We'll be in Acts 18 verses 1 through 17. And just to give you a little uh, of some insight on the way that I'm looking at the, pa the passage, we're going to kind of go back door on this passage. And here's what I mean. If you've been tracking with us in the book of Acts, we've oftentimes looked at the front door. What, what behavior, what posture, what activity do we see happening in the life of the witness that Luke is focusing on? Today, I want to kind of go behind that and ask the question, how is Jesus at work on the witness in the passage? I think that's the focus. If you have a red letter Bible and you see the Jesus, Jesus's words, uh, they shape this entire passage. And I think we can make the case that uh, what could have been a place of immense pain and sorrow and sadness for Paul actually turns into an oasis of comfort. This is God's word. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and he worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade the Jews and the Greeks but when Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul could then be occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own heads, I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord, together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you. For I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. But when Gallio, who was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. And they all see Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and they beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to any of this. Let's pray. Dear Lord, your word is alive, and you are pleased uh, to use your servant uh, to proclaim the riches thereof. Father, uh, I'm aware of my need uh, for cleansing, my need for grace, my need of wisdom that is not my own to rightly divide your word. And Father, I pray that uh, you would increase and that I would decrease. And I pray for your church, that she will be built up in love and that as we leave this place, that we will love you more and marvel in you more and rest in your good work to us more than we did and when we entered. Speak through your servant, I pray uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. I think the city of Corinth could have been a breaking point for the Apostle Paul. Instead, it turned out to be an oasis of comfort. Now, why do I think Corinth could have been a breaking point that drove him to utter despair? You might remember earlier in Acts when Jesus appears to Ananias. He tells Ananias that Paul is a chosen instrument of mine to proclaim the good news to Gentiles, to kings, and to the people of Israel. And he told him, and, and he will suffer severely for my name. And suffering was Paul's lot. He was struck with blindness. 
that once he came to faith, he tried to enter into the fellowship in Jerusalem, and the people there were afraid of him. And then when he preached the good news, the Jews there tried to kill him, and so Paul had to leave and go to Tarsus. He stayed in Tarsus for several years until Barnabas came to get him, and he brought him back to Antioch. And there they discipled the Christians there for a year. And then when things were getting good for Paul and Barnabas, the Holy Spirit says, hey, I'm sending them away. Sent him to Cyprus, the island, and then up into some of the cities. And he sent him into persecution. That what you start to read when you read Acts 13 through 16 is city after city after city after city. He's beaten and he's persecuted. He's left for dead. He's arrested in prison. He is flogged. He is stoned. That he's suffering. And it wasn't just that he suffered in those cities, that we actually have word that once they beat him, that the wicked mob followed him from Thessalonica and tried to get him in Berea. And he fled from Berea into where he was last week, Athens, and he made it to Athens alone by himself, fleeing persecution. He was the Mediterranean's most wanted man. He not only suffered physical pain, he suffered relational pain. That we never read of Paul having a wife or children. I don't think a woman would marry him. We don't hear about him writing about his family of origin, about his parents, about siblings. That it, it reads as if maybe there was relational loss when he decided to follow the Messiah that Barnabas had to vouch for him in Acts because the disciples didn't trust him. And then he and Barnabas fell out of fellowship over John Mark. And then when he was being persecuted, he was sent away where he went to Athens alone. His Jews, the people that he loved, he says, I wish that I were cut off, that they might come to faith. You hear that? He's deeply wounded relationally. He also suffers vocationally. That you read of Jews rejecting his message and the fruit of the gospel is going among the Gentiles. But think about last week. He went to, to Athens, which would have been the intellectual capital of the world, defended the faith on Mars Hill or the Areopagus. And we read of a few converts. Dionysus, the Areopagite, and Damaris, and a few others. So that by the time he gets to Corinth, he's bruised, he's beaten, he's broke, and he's alone. What do you think this stretch of his journey does to his soul? We don't have to think. Ben Witherington says that we should read Acts 18 and 1 Corinthians alongside of each other. He says there are points of convergence between the two. Both Acts 18 and the book of 1 Corinthians, they mention Aquila and Priscilla. They both mention Paul earning a living through his trade. They both mention the, the baptism of Crispus. They both mention this man named Sosthenes. They both mention Timothy's participation in ministry. And guess what else 1 Corinthians tells us about the Apostle Paul? It says, Paul, he went there in fear and in weakness and in much trembling. That's how Paul was doing when he made it to Corinth. He was afraid and he was lonely and he was tired. Here's the question. If you were God for a day and your servant Paul had endured all of that, what would be your posture towards him? Different question. If this was your spouse or your best friend, or your parents, or your children. And they were alone, and broke, and bruised, and sad, and discouraged. What would your posture be? Would you leave them there alone? Or would you move heaven and earth to be near them? Would you buy a one-way ticket 
to go comfort them and to sit with them in the sadness? Would you buy a one-way ticket and just go and cook meals and listen and cry and weep and show up? Or would you, knowing that they've gone through hell on earth, turn your back and walk away and say, hey, you fixed that yourself. Which would your posture be? Would it not be to show up? Of course it would. We don't have to guess about how God feels about Paul in this place. Steve just read a passage from Isaiah, and Isaiah sees a picture, an image of the Son of Man. And when he sees the servant of the Lord, it says, a bruised reed he will not break. A smoldering wick he will not put out. And here's the irony that when you get over to Matthew chapter 12, Jesus heals those who have withered hands and he does miracles. And then Matthew says, Jesus did that because he, right, is fulfilling what Isaiah said about the Messiah. The Messiah will be one who moves towards the broken. Those who are bent over and are about to give up in life, the Messiah will draw near and comfort. He will not bend them over and let them break. He will not put their fire out. He will show up and put more oil in their lamps that their light might continue to burn. That's the posture of Jesus. And here's the thing, the same Jesus that Isaiah sees in Isaiah 42 is the same Jesus who's in Matthew chapter 12, and he's the same Jesus who is in Acts chapter 18. That when Paul is down and out and in fear and in weakness and is in much trembling and is alone and is broke and is almost bent over, we should anticipate that the Lord Jesus will draw near. And it's precisely why it is here of all places that Jesus shows up and says, Paul, fear not. I'm with you in this. What we see happening here is not happen chance. This is Jesus moving towards a bruised servant to transform this city that would have broken him into an oasis of comfort. That's what's happening here. And here's the thing. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He is unchanging. He is on the throne right now. And what is his posture towards you? If you are bruised, if you are broken, if you are weary, if you are tired, if you are uncertain, what is the posture of Jesus towards you? What we see in this passage is that Jesus doesn't just care about the work of the witness. He cares about the witness doing the work. He cares about Paul. He cares about his encouragement and his comfort, not just his missional fruit. He cares about the man doing the mission. We can deduce from this passage, Redeemer, that Jesus is a great king and he will give his witnesses like you and I seasons of comfort on the hills of seasons of tragedy and hardship. He will show up. He is faithful and he will do it. So I want to look at this gift of comfort that Jesus gives Paul. Look, look, y'all, this is a fruitful place. Paul stays there a year and a half and many Corinthians believe. Praise God. But you got to see behind it, Jesus is doing something in Paul and for Paul and with Paul. That's what I want to look at this morning. How does Jesus comfort Paul? Which we could say, how does Jesus comfort us when we're there? Three things. And they're all begin with a letter P with his presence, with his people and with his protection. He gives Paul those three things, presence, people, protection. Now, first point, he comforts his bruised people with his special presence. If you look at verse nine, there's a lot to unpack. And, and that has shaped kind of the points of our message this morning. But notice what Paul, what, what, what Luke tells us that Jesus did. 
And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent. And that's the phrase you ought to underline. I am with you. Now, there are some other things, but, but the, the, the pinnacle is the fact that the divine presence, like Jesus himself says, I'm with you. He is the best gift of comfort given to Paul in the passage. Now, where have we seen language like this where, where I'm with you? We've seen it in Isaiah. That's what Steve read. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Not that you won't go through the waters, not that you won't go through the fire, but you won't go through them alone. I will be right there with you, says the Lord, and the waves will not overwhelm you. The fire will not consume you. You see it in Joshua. When Joshua is about to take the mantle and lead the people of God, Moses is dead. And the Lord says, Joshua, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed for the Lord. Your God is with you. Now, Joshua had to go into battle and it will be hard, but he did not go into battle alone in the moment of crises, in the moment when he was afraid. That is when the divine God, Yahweh, shows up and says, hey, I'm with you. God has a history of drawing near to his people as they enter into hard stretches of the journey. Now, this is a, we, we got to pose a question, though, because didn't Jesus tell the disciples that, lo, I am with you even until the end of the age? What do you mean, Jesus? That means you were with him in Philippi? Yep. You were with him in Thessalonica? Yep. You was with him when he was getting flogged? Yep. When he was getting stoned? Yep. So what's different about this passage? What's different is that Jesus makes more of his presence known. Did you stop and look at, look at that? Look at that verse again. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision. Now we're Presbyterian. And you got to deal with that. This isn't just Paul had a thought. Or Paul was reading Isaiah, and when he read Isaiah, the, the thought, it, it, it seeped into his soul. No, this is a theophany. This is a, a, an appearance of the resurrected Jesus in this place to say, Paul, I want you to do more than meditate on the Old Testament and then to seek comfort there. No, 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 no. I, I want you to do more than just have a thought of me. I'm going to show you the divine presence. That is an accommodation of Paul's weakness so that in this moment, Jesus says, glory, you will see my glory. You will see me. You will dwell with me. Now we can, th this makes sense, right? So when I met my wife, we were 18 in Huntsville, Alabama, and she went to school in Tuscaloosa. I stayed in Huntsville. And for the first year or so, we tried to kind of stay in contact. And so in her absence, I would call. And at that point, at her dorm, they didn't have phones in everybody's room. So you had one dorm, one floor had like one phone, one phone. And so you called and somebody got to go get her out of her room. And, and so we, we wrote and we have let, that, that's not like face to face, but it'll do. And the second time we started dating, we didn't have to buy expensive phone cards anymore and have phone calls. Something called a cell phone was out and we had unlimited minutes and we could just stay on the phone all night long. And then technology happened and y'all can send pictures now. And technology happened again and now we can get an image of a person that we can't be with right now in the flesh, but, but we can FaceTime. And that's way better than a letter. That's way better than just a voice. That, that, that is a that almost perfect thing, almost perfect thing to be able to see facial expressions and smiles and hair and makeup and, and haircuts and laughter like you can see it. Here's what Jesus does for Paul right here. He says, I'm not just going to give you a letter. I'm going to FaceTime you. I'm going to let you see me. And it's not the same as being with me, but I'm going to give you something better than you've had. And he chooses to do it in Corinth of all places. Man, this place was so scandalous that if you lived there in, in that day and age and you wanted to curse somebody out, you called them a Corinthian. It was a profane word. 
They had a temple of Aphrodite where we believe thousands of, quote, prostitutes, as Dr. Kurz has did their bidding in the city. Have you ever read 1 Corinthians? Paul has to tell the men, fellas, your body doesn't belong to you. It belongs to your wife. Why are you taking Jesus into a, a prostitute? Wives, your body doesn't belong to you. It belongs to your husband. Why are you denying them? He has to actually mediate. This dude is sleeping with his, his stepmother. They're having communion, and one dude got his feet kicked up, and he getting drunk off the wine. They're taking each other to court. That's Corinth. It was on an isthmus. And I don't, didn't know what an isthmus was. I, I forgot that geography lesson. But it's a thin strip of land that separates two larger bodies of land. And right here is Corinth. And on the top is sea, ocean. On the bottom, sea, ocean. And if you wanted to travel to get here, you, could not, you didn't have to go all the way around and come back up. That's 250 extra miles that Corinth became known for this divide. They found a way back then to part the land so that you could dock your, your boat up there. You could have it brought through the city and pick it up on the other side. Therefore, where Athens was the intellectual capital of the world, Corinth was a commercial city where sailors came. Whatever happened in Corinth stayed in Corinth. It's in that city of all places that Jesus says, I'm with you. Why is that important? It's important because Jesus knows no limits. There is no place you can be in. There's no city you can go to. There's no county you can reside in. There's no situation you can find yourself in that Jesus can't tell you, I'm with you. I'm with you. And it's hard, but I'm with you. And that makes a world of a difference. Have you not tasted that? Where life is just hard and all of a sudden a thought a truth about God is lodged in your heart and it grows and it grows and it grows and your situation around you may not change but you realize that someone else is there and someone else is walking with you in it Jackie Hill Perry in her book gay girl good God speaks of Jesus showing up when she least expected it. She was gay and she was with her girlfriend at the time. And all of a sudden, one morning, she hears something. And what she heard was this. She will be the death of you. And she said she's got up and she looked around because she was trying to figure out where, where did that come from? Where did that come from? And she walked into another room to see who's in my house. And, she, and then she said she calmed down and she knew exactly who it came from. It was Jesus telling her, meeting her in her sin. She will be the death of you. Do you believe that the Lord Jesus has that kind of power? That wherever you are and whatever you're doing. He himself can arrest your attention and let you know that you are not alone. And that is a good thing. He comforts us with his presence. The second thing, Jesus comforts the bruised witnesses with the people of God. The people of God. Now notice verse one, after Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, Verse two, and he found a Jew named Aquila at the end of verse two, and he went to see them. Verse three, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them. Now, this is important because in Acts, you will often see we did this. And when he says we, that means the author of Acts, Luke, is with them. Sometimes he'll say they did this. And when it says they, it means that Luke isn't there, but he is remembering what someone told him about. But, 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 but Paul is not alone. 
What you get here is he. So Paul was alone in Athens, and Paul was alone when he arrived in Corinth. But he wouldn't stay alone. See, I think he's alone and he's broke. 1 Corinthians 4, God has exhibited us apostles. Last of all, we are a spectacle to the world. To the present hour, we hunger and we thirst and we are poorly dressed and we are buffeted and we are homeless and we labor with our own hands. That's what Paul is saying about him. He says, bro, we broke. We don't have nice clothes. Some of us don't even have homes. And so take that and lay that on top of this. He came there. Well, guess what Jesus is doing? One of his gifts to Paul Look at verse 9 again. I have many in this city who are my people. Now, we tend to read that and think that what Jesus is saying is, Paul, I got a lot of fruit for you to bear. When you go and preach the gospel, a lot of people are going to be converted. Yes, but I think there's more there. I think what Jesus is telling Paul, I got people here. A lot of people. And you won't be here alone. And what you see Jesus doing in this section is giving Paul the body of Christ. Now notice, he comes alone, but as soon as he gets there, he finds a Jew named Aquila. That's a man who was a native of Pontus, who had come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because the emperor there had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And so when Paul, and they settled in Corinth, and when Paul found them, Look at verse 3. It says he stayed with them. So this homeless apostle has a home. And then he worked with them because they were of the same trade. So this jobless apostle now gets a job. And it's because of who? It's because Priscilla and Aquila were there. Now, here's the question. Read Acts 18 in light of Acts 17. How did they get there? On the surface, it says they came there because Claudius kicked them out. Well, they didn't have to come to Corinth. They could have went anywhere else. So why Corinth? It's because of what Paul said in Acts 17. Remember when he was defending the gospel? He says, God establishes our habitation, our dwelling places, and our times on the earth. And what you see Jesus doing in this passage? Paul, I control where Aquila and Priscilla go. Claudius, they're not here because of Claudius. They're here because of me. And I control the fact that they have the same trade as you. They are tent makers. They work with leather. And I'm the one bringing you here. In other words, what you see behind all of this is gift. This is Jesus Christ giving this lonely man who showed up in this city a family and a way to make a living and community. But Jesus keeps giving. Look at verse 5. And then Silas and Timothy arrive. Jesus is showing out. Your partners that you've been waiting on, I'm going to make sure they get here too, brother. And they're going to show up right on time. And so notice what happens. All right. Look at verse 4 and look at verse 5. Verse 4. Paul, when he was staying with Priscilla and Aquila, he worked. They worked. And then he reasoned in the synagogues every Sabbath. Right? Right? So when did he do his work of preaching and teaching? Verse 4 says he did that when? On the Sabbath. So he likely worked during the week, and on the Sabbath, that was the one day that he took off, and he preached the gospel. Now what happened when Silas and Timothy arrived? He was able to be occupied with the word. I thought you just said he was doing the word, so what is it? I think this is intensity. That before they arrived, he worked. And he reasoned in the gospel on the Sabbath. When they arrived, he was all in on the gospel. Why? Because they came bearing gifts. The gift of a beautiful report that the churches in Thessalonica that you were snatched away from, they are still good. And money. Listen to 2 Corinthians 11. When I was with you in Corinth, I was in need, and I did not burden anyone. For the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied my need. 
So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way. You hear that? They not only came bringing a good report, they came bringing gifts from the church. That's Jesus saying, Paul, you won't be hungry. You won't be homeless. You won't be friendless. I'm going to give you the body. And it keeps getting better. That notice what happens when Paul, in verse 7, that he, that he was preaching, verses 5 through 7, he's preaching in the synagogue, and then the Jews oppose him and revile him. He shakes his garments and says, hey, I'm going to go to the Gentiles now. He left the synagogue and went all the way next door. You read that? He left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, who was a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. <laughs> Y'all, that's kind of comical, ain't it? They kicking Paul out of the synagogue and Jesus like, hey, you ain't got to roll that far, brother. I got you right next door. You hear how gracious Jesus is being to him? You can set up shop and you don't have to go far. This is Jesus' gift to Paul. It's people. What picture of Paul do you have in your mind? Long beard, walking with a cane, getting bit by snakes, and still living when he should have died. Trekking up mountains to go to these foreign cities to put the gospel in the city alone. You'd be wrong. There's an A to Z of Paul's ministry that entails people. I went through and read the epistles this week, and you'll discover name after name of people that Paul missed, that he labored side by side with, that he prayed for, that he wanted to see. Listen to this list, and it's in, I put it in alphabetical order, it's not written this way, and maybe you might find some names that I missed, but, but listen. A is for Achaicus, Apollos, Aphia, Aquila, Archippus, Aristarchus. B is for Barnabas. C is for Claudia and Clement. D is for Demas. E is for Epaphras and Epaphroditus and Erastus and Eubulus and Eudea. F is for Fortunatus and G is for Gaius and J is for Jason. And L is for Linus and Luke and Lydia. And M is for Mark and O is for Onesiphorus and Onesimus. P is for Philemon and Priscilla and Pudence. S is for Silas and Silvanus and Stephanus and Sosthenes and Sintike. And T is for Timothy and Trophimus and Tychicus and Z is for Zenus the lawyer. Those are all the names of real people mentioned in Paul's writings that he loved, that he knew, that he longed for, and that were gift of Jesus to him. There's an African proverb, if you want to go fast, you go alone. If you want to go far, you go together. We have drank the poison of American individualism. Where we think my strength and my intellect and my money and my power and my job and my fortitude and my endurance, and my wisdom, and my knowledge. We think that's sufficient to finish the race. It's not. It's poison. It's poison. And it's toxic. And it's destructive. And Jesus did not die for you, for you to do life alone. He died for you to do life in the body, in the church. How many stretches of your life that have been difficult can you look back on and say, it was the body. Jesus was gracious to me in the body. 
That's why the author of Proverbs says, two are better than one. When one falls, another can lift him up. Woe to the one who is alone, and when he falls, he does not have another to lift him up. A mighty man might prevail against one who is alone, but two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not easily broken. We are coming on the heels of COVID, and one of the most destructive things about the pandemic is not that it takes the life, but that it harms our souls. We're watching TV alone. We're eating dinner alone. We're making sense of the world alone. We're fighting our sin alone. We're trying to persevere alone. We're facing inflation alone. That, that, That will kill us. Poverty can be endured together. Doubts can be engaged together. Fights can be won together. Sin can be conquered together. Joy can be discovered together. And this is how Jesus encourages us when life is hard. It's with the body. It's with other believers walking with us, crying with us, listening to us, rebuking us, encouraging us, bringing us groceries, opening their homes, offering their prayers. I got stretches in my journey. I wouldn't have made it. I wouldn't be standing before you if it were not for the body. If you're in a hard season, don't drink the poison. One of Jesus' greatest gifts of comfort outside of his own presence is his own people. If you're not engaged and you're drifting, I'd encourage you. Get in a men's gathering where you can confess sin and be prayed for. Get in a woman's, women's connect group where you can study the scriptures. Send your kids to youth group and upside down. Their little souls need community. If you're on a college campus, find other Christians. You weren't meant to do life alone. Last thing, Jesus comforts this bruised witness with temporary and total protection. Look at Jesus' words again. He doesn't just say, I have people. He doesn't just say, I'm with you. He also says, no one will attack you to harm you. That's protection. And here's the irony. Like when you read all of this section, the kitchen is on fire and Paul is never burned. Remember those Jews who chased him down from Thessalonica to Berea? They've lost his scent. They don't come to Corinth. Remember when he preaches in synagogues and the Jews in other cities come to beat him and to lay hands on him? He himself is not touched here. They bring him towards Gallio, the proconsul, thinking that Gallio, on the Bema seat, this place of judgment in Corinth, would execute a sentence. And Gallio, before Paul even has to make a defense, he's like, I don't even want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I'm not getting involved in this. Do you see what's happening here? That Paul leaves here unscathed. Now, why? It's because Jesus says they won't harm you here. This is divine protection. And Jesus still does this. He still shows up and we go through hard seasons. And he says, you won't be harmed. Now, you've heard stories, if you've read any missionary biography of missionaries in other countries, when they get the saints here to pray, pray for protection, pray for an open door. 
And there are numerous books where these missionaries, they write about this tribe was about to harm us. And then they saw this image of Jesus around them and they did not sabotage us. Right. You can read that. And I've read it on multiple occasions. But let's bring it a little closer to home. Jesus's protection is also here for us right here and now. So several years ago, before we transitioned from Jackson State to Redeemer, I didn't know what God wanted me to do. And so I went to New York and spent a month there. I went to D.C. I went to Camden, New Jersey. And that's a a, a rough city. And I spent probably four or five nights with Doug Logan, who's preached in our pulpit here. I just said, Doug, I know Jesus is calling us to something, and I don't know what. And I stayed with him. And right across the street from his house on the corner is a park. And in that park, they have repaved it. They put basketball courts up. I mean, there are children playground stuff. And he says, hey, this used to not always look like that. He says that that was where crack was sold. That is where kids were murdered. That is where fights happened. And so Doug has recently written a chapter in a book called Urban Apologetics. And in his chapter, he writes this. While we were doing community outreach, we adopted a park across the street from my home. And a man selling drugs on the street accused me of messing up his business by having Christians on the block cleaning it up and giving out food and drinks. He told me he was a Muslim and he hated our presence. He went on to say the Bible was made up by the white man to lead black folk away from the truth of the Quran. And we went back and forth about those points for several minutes until he said, look, bro, showing me his gun. You need to leave. And do you believe in Jesus enough right now for me to pull it on you? And Doug said, I do. And the man was flabbergasted that he would let him shoot him right there in Camden for the sake of the gospel. And the guy put the gun back down and says, bro, you're crazy. And after that incident, He says, I thank the living God for his protecting grace. And our outreach team continue to share the gospel, pray over and serve people. This incident was one of many hostile encounters we walked away from. Don't tell me that Jesus does not protect his people. He does. Now, here's the thing. Paul's protection would expire he's going to go die in Rome and preach his last sermon and write his last epistle and breathe his last breath. Are the words that Jesus utters to him in this chapter in vain? Is Jesus a liar? And the answer is no. What Jesus does in this chapter is give him temporary and total protection. And I'm convinced that this is a picture. It's a picture of Jesus's power. It's a picture that he will keep us so that when the gauntlet comes and the head is cut off, that the saint and the Lord dies knowing that Messiah has uttered no untrue word. That I think this is a pivotal point in Paul's ministry where he could say death has lost its sting. He could say to die is to be in the presence of the Lord. He could say that that Jesus Christ has overcome hell and the grave. And he showed me he showed me that moment in Corinth. He showed me that all power and all might is in his hand. And if the Messiah says no, then nothing will happen to me. And if the Messiah 
brings it about, then he will bring me into his glory and I will see him forever. You see, I think the gospel is enacted here. There is one person who is beat in this passage and it's not Paul. Look at the last verse. Is Sosthenes. They see Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and they beat him in front of the tribunal. That word tribunal is, is, is the bema, this place of judgment where judgment was carried out in Corinth. And here is Paul on this day. Jesus tells him, they won't harm you. You're safe. But he sees his friend Sosthenes go to the bema seat and be beaten. And Paul gets to go scot-free. Y'all know where else Paul brings up? Appearing before the bema seat of Jesus? In 2 Corinthians, he says we must all appear there. But guess what? The good news for the saint is when you stand before Jesus and the judgment of Jesus you will not be bruised. You are eternally protected from the wrath of God. Why? Because someone greater than Sosthenes has been beaten in your place. Messiah. You have, if you are in Jesus, temporary protection, but you got something greater. You have eternal protection. Because he has tasted death for you. Do you not love Jesus more for this? He gives you his presence. He gives you his people. He gives you his protection. And if you don't know Jesus, you are walking through trials alone. And it doesn't have to be that way. You can bow the knee today and believe in your heart that he is Lord and God raised him from the dead. And you'll never live a day alone. You'll never go through life alone. You will always have the sovereign protection of King Jesus. And it's gift. May it be so. Let's pray. Father, we bless your name and we thank you for your word. I thank you, Jesus, that you not only care about the work that the witness does, but you care about your witnesses. Father, I pray that you will comfort our hearts with your presence, with your people, and may we taste of your protection. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen.